And then we can just do um, cut some questions and stuff at the end. Obviously, this is the first time we've done, I think, a remote video talk to LCA. And I wish I was there so much. So thank you all still for coming to my remotely given talk. <laughs> it will be a good test, I think, for potential future LCA stuff. Um, but um, so, and, and first of all, I should say I'm not here in any official capacity. I'm not speaking for any of the things that I might be perceived to work for. <laughs> um, so I'm here in a personal capacity talking about stuff that I care about. So I'll jump across to some slides. I've put these up um, publicly already. And if anyone has questions, feel free to throw them onto Twitter, onto um, you know at Pia Wharf, or um, or just throw them to Ryan, and he can type them into the chat here. We can just do them live afterwards. So whichever way works for you. Okay. Can you see my slides? Cool. All right. So I'll start. I just wanted to start with the concept of government as an API. So a lot of you will get this a lot more intuitively than a lot of people I usually deal with, but it's really, and it is an American um, picture, so you know, apologies for anyone that you know, doesn't like that, but it, it's really getting down to the concept that government isn't just a top-down institution um, or series of institutions that does stuff for people anymore. It's really just part of a network. And if we, as well, if the people that work in government can actually make government work more like um, you know, one of, a node in a big network of stuff, then um, the information, the services, the, you know, the, the good stuff the government does can actually be consumed by other people and, you know, turned into something that could be programmatically, um, you know, used in other applications, in other research, in other tools, um, you know, and fed from other places. But the idea is that um, starting to move from a, a top-down hierarchy into, you know, just one of just one of the many network, um, nodes in the network, and becoming a bit more relevant for that, because I think a lot of people in government think, well, you know, it, government is important, therefore people will come to us. But people don't; they go to where the information is. So if government's not out there and available and accessible, then you know, people will go elsewhere. So I thought I'd start with a couple of challenges that I think are important around why government needs to move towards being like API and where open source standards and, and data fits into that. But I'll start with a couple of challenges. The first one is that most governments around the world, um, you know, they're not going to get more money. <laughs> um, it's hard to ensure you've got the right people, let alone getting more people, and it's hard to ensure you've got the right skills. So there's this constant crying out for, you know, can I have more, and then a constant slapping on the <laughs> on the wrist of bad kitty, in my opinion. Um, so. Starting to get a, an understanding of the fact that there's not necessarily you can't necessarily just throw more people money skills at a problem. You need to actually start um, um, learning how to do things in a different way, learning how to collaborate, learning how to work with the community, learning, learning how to work across departments, across governments, across the world, um, with industry, with you know community groups to actually solve problems in a more collaborative fashion. It's the only way the government can become more resilient, can come more um, uh, responsive to rapidly changing expectations of the people that the government's supposed to serve. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's really important to understand that there is a perceived problem about resources, but there's also a pressure um, to, to change how things are done because the old way is not going to continue um, really much more. Status quo. I get to hear a lot of people say, you know, but, but this worked before, and I, you know, I, I think that a horse and cart is a cute way of demonstrating that just because it worked before doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way of doing it now. Um, I think that inertia is sometimes hard to move, and it depends on the government. It depends on the level. I mean, I work, I've worked in, um, um, I guess, the state and territory government um, level, and I've worked in the federal level. And then the local level in Australia is a whole different one. In New Zealand, I think you're pretty lucky. You've got sort of two levels of government, which, believe it or not, actually makes life a lot easier because you don't have, because it's exponentially more tricky when you've got three levels than two. Um, but um, getting to this point of just because it worked before doesn't mean it's going to continue to work, I think, is, is fairly important. Um, another <laughs> challenge is the culture clash. I was actually having a chat just this morning with a, a good friend who um, has been in government for sort of 30 years, and um, but who's very much a, a sort of one of us. He really does think about things in in um, internet terms, I guess, and, and with internet culture. But you know, a lot of people who um, are involved internationally, who see themselves as part of a global community first, I guess, and then um, maybe a company or, or maybe a uh, maybe a national, maybe you know. But we don't see ourselves first and foremost as um, 
part of a hierarchy. We actually see ourselves as part of a, um, a global society. And that's um, a very, very big change in perspective. So a hierarchical thinking person will tend to go sideways or, you know, they'll escalate an issue rather than just talk to someone. They'll figure out ways to work within a system, whereas this new breed of people, like, you know, us, tend to route around damage. We, se we tend to see something that gets in the way of doing something well as damage, and whether that's technical or social. So, you know, we get around things, we fix stuff, we just figure out how to make it happen. And that's a real culture clash. Um, it, it can be both good, it can be <laughs> challenging, but in some ways it's a lot of fun, and that's just the, um, the naughty peer coming out, I think. But, um, but it is a, something to acknowledge, because when you're trying to deal with people who um, you want to do the right thing, but they approach the world in quite a different way, you need to be aware of that and, um, and, and sort of help bring people along a little bit for the ride or, again, just route around damage. But there's a culture clash going on between and even within governments around the world. Um, there's the concept that government is complex or governments are complex. And how to make it simple isn't just a matter of, well, you know, just make a rule or make a law or legislate or, um, or take money off people or give money to people or force something. It's a multi-headed hydra. It, it, just because one department does something well doesn't mean they all do it well. Just because one department does something bad doesn't mean they all do it bad. Government and learning how to affect change in government, um, and I mean in the public service particular, is, um, is a matter of starting to understand that there are loads of different trigger points and leads and, um, and it, it, you know, it is like any good sysadmin needs to go and figure out the system um, with governments and with figuring out how to make government better, we actually need to put some time into figuring out the system if you want to actually make a change. Um, so understanding that it is complex and that we need to figure out ways to make it simple. Um, we can't just expect it to become magically simple is, I, I think, important. Um, I think that a big change, a big challenge of the that the governments are facing at the moment is, is the rise of the te technocracy. The fact is that anything you want to implement, and thank you XKCD, but anything you want to implement ends up getting implemented in technology. Um, you end up having, you know, your IT department or a tech team or a contractor or a geek um, sitting down and actually putting into action the thing, you know, the bright idea that you came up with. Now, of course, we've, that's led to a huge disconnect where the IT department is only spoken to at the end of the process, which is way too late, arguably. So we need to pull those skills and pull that discussion into the very early, early part of how government works, which is a change for government and which is tricky for government because a lot of people in government, particularly people who work on policy, see the work they do as being top of the food chain and the implementation is just, you know, those other people. Um, but implementation and policy uh, needs to go hand in hand, otherwise you end up with policy that can't be implemented or implementations that don't support the policy. Um, and, and I think the other part of that is that there is starting to be a recognition that you need to have, not necessarily just, you know, every geek in the, you know, in the room, but you need to have people with technical literacy in the room as part of that planning, um, you know, very early on and very high up. Changing expectations, I do love this slide, I use it often because I, <laughs> I like to remind public servants that, um, that, you know, the people out there, even at this age, probably know better in, in some cases and we need to respect that, engage with that and, um, and, you know, and support that. But the expectations of the public are changing and will be to change and will always change. And so that's a challenge because people, I think, in government see that as um, sometimes a problem. Um, but actually, it's a real opportunity. Um, if people's expectation is changing, then how do you build um, a way of doing government that can respond to the change today and to the change tomorrow? Like there's, you know, it's not about building a user design that supports how people want to talk to government today and then just putting that in place over three years. It's a matter of building the building blocks that then support the user designer today and the user designer tomorrow because it's able to be re-consumed by whatever approach you want to take. But I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But changing expectations is certainly a big challenge, but also a huge opportunity for government to be more resilient, more relevant, more effective. So I thought I'd also just throw in a little bit of Game of Thrones, because why not? Um, people see government as, you know, this off in the clouds, you know, hard to get to single entity that kind of is disconnected from their real lives and their real worlds, right? Um, government see people. <laughs> 
almost as um, you know, you know, way down the bottom of a huge cliff, and you know, climbing up just to get in the way, and to sort of you know, why, why do people not know that government's doing you know the best thing for them? And this kind of us versus them, they're on the other side of a moat, and we need a big moat full of fire to to um, so that we can best serve people is. Is, is you know certainly a, a mentality that I come across quite regularly. So they see you know the citizens as as um, very very much similar to the northerners, um, and then government has to, government sees government is as just a series of fiefdoms. You know um, each individual one has its own flag, has its own loyalties, its own relationships, its own power structures. And by the way, this map is just of one department. Uh, this map is just one department. There's um there's a real problem around people creating fiefdoms. So one of, one of the and this is a challenge as well, but it's also an opportunity is that government needs to move from hierarchy to a peer-to-peer -peer model, uh, to an understanding that um, citizens don't care which department you work for, they don't care what level of government you work for, they don't care what country you're in in some cases. Yeah, you know, they want to get access to the services and the information that's relevant to them, and they want to get access to it now in a way that's convenient to them, but isn't too creepy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, moving from hierarchy to P2P is a is a big sort of part of this new world order. So, how do we do this? You know, we've got this, this all these challenges. We've got all these governments not going to change fundamentally. You know, in in a lot of ways, it's going to continue to be difficult. It's going to continue to be complex. It's going to continue to be reasonably large, um, you know, compared to, you know, a, a small business, but um, but it needs to change. So how do we do this? So um, the here's a couple of initial thoughts that I've been having, and I've sort of been writing about this a little bit and having some fun with these ideas and testing my ideas within government, but these are just a couple of initial ways that we might be able to take the horse to water. First of all, we need to recognise that we can't always change the system. We need to figure out how to translate the system. Sometimes we need short-term ways to interact with the current system, the current um, methods, the current processes, the current ways of doing things in order to move people towards a better way of doing things. That means we need to learn, and this is certainly something um, that I've you know, really applied in my work, is um, learning to translate the language, you know, from understanding how public servants speak, how they're trained, um, how they're taught, um, helps you understand how to work with them to do something better. Because most public servants, believe it or not, are real human beings <laughs> who are trying to actually do some good stuff. And if you can show them how changing what they're doing will actually do what they want to do better, often enough they'll do it. Um, a lot of public servants push back on change because they think that change for change's sake is a bad idea and that's not necessarily a bad tenant, but they don't um, immediately always understand that um, what you're suggesting is actually for everyone's benefit. So, um, and then we can take that from a, you know, translation of culture and languages to also translation of sources and systems. So you might, um, the amount of times someone has said to me, oh, we can't possibly do that because our system doesn't support it, and, um, and me being the Geek that I'm getting a feedback right now. Sorry, and now I'm getting. Can you hear me again? I might mute you. Yeah? Can you mute yourself? Uh, yeah, but I'm going to mute you though because I'm. Okay, I'm muting you. There we go. <laughs> Just for a moment. All right, so. Um, so finding ways to translate existing systems is important. So even if your system doesn't support doing something in a particular way, the system is supported by a database or a backend or a, um, you know, th there's usually a programmatic way to talk to a system that may not be through the front door. So getting people to recognize that a system isn't just how they interact with a system as a user, there are many ways that you can actually create a translation of systems and services. Um, then you've also got, um, Encouraging people about why to make a change. You know, is it better? Is it more efficient? Is it more effective? Um, does it help them in the long run? Does it help them in the short run? Um, and if it doesn't help them at all, then you're going to you're going to find it hard to actually encourage people to change. Uh, and I'll go through DataGovAU and how that's been an example of that um, in a minute. But creating paths of least, least resistance. This is one of my favourite things. I learnt. Um, I forget the name of the concept now, but. I briefly did physics at uni, and um, and for some reason it really stuck with me. This idea of 
building physical infrastructure that you know it corrals water into the right way. Um, you know, the same thing applies to livestock, and <laughs> the same thing applies to people. Strangely enough, we're not actually that much different from animals as we like to um, <laughs> believe. But if you can actually create a path of least resistance, which is the path of most technical excellence, people tend to follow it. Um, a, a quick example is um, telling people to put their data in data gov. You you know, doesn't work, never worked. Telling people that, oh, we've got this new functionality that if you put your data on data.gov.au in a machine readable way, and by the way, we can train you how to do that, it'll automatically build an API for you. And then you can build your apps around it, and then you can do this, and then you can do that, then other people can build visualizations and such. So giving people a, a path of least resistance, because it's, it's easier to put up machine readable data than to go and build your own API to your own internal systems, means that people tend to follow it. So trying to figure out what those barriers are and dealing with that. Um, I think take personal risk is a big thing in the public service. Well, everyone wants to push risk away. But, you know, if you as an individual, either outside or inside the government, um, are willing to take a little bit of personal risk and actually willing to do stuff and lead the way and show the benefits of a different way of doing things, I find um, often enough that will make a huge difference because um, people assume it takes a lot of effort and a lot of money and a lot of time to do anything useful. But as we all know, you can do things very quickly and very effect, you know, really awesomely when you get the right people and skills and, and ideas in the room. So um, actually leading the way is a really great way to change perspectives and to get people thinking in new and interesting ways. And even indeed following a better path. Continually proving why a better path is better, I think is important. Uh, you don't want to just um, make the assumption that, hey, this way of doing things is better and here's why, and then forget to continue to prove it. Because if two years, ten years down the track, someone questions it and you can't show that it has actually been beneficial, you know, then it, 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 it becomes questionable, it becomes contested. So um, you've got to almost build into your system, you know, what are your metrics, what are your success criteria, what are you actually trying to achieve, and how can you show that you're achieving it? It's really important. And I think one of the other ideas that's really permeated certainly the, the federal government in Australia, and I'm seeing it all around the place, is this idea of putting the citizen at the centre of how we do stuff. Uh, this is interesting because even though it does lead to, um, it, it can lead to all kinds of different outcomes, if everyone starts with the idea that what we do should benefit the citizen, then, um, then that becomes a single tenant that everyone can agree on. I might bring to the table, you know, reusable, reconsumable, modular systems development so that we can better adapt our front-end systems to support the citizen. Someone else might bring to the table user-centered design so that we can actually design an experience and a journey based on what a person actually needs as opposed to what an individual department thinks that people should have. So, you know, it, it becomes a nice idea that sort of brings everyone together. Um, I'm going to keep flicking back here just in case Ryan wants to tell me anything in chat uh, that I get wrong <laughs> but, uh, and make sure I've got the timing right. So in terms of how this all relates to open data, um, uh, open source and open standards, um, yeah, I have found, and I've sort of spoken about this at a couple of forums now, but my background in open source has, um, and with our community, has been key to you know, to any and all of the successes that I've had and that I continue to have with my work in um, in Australian governments, um, partly because of well, for, for a whole bunch of reasons. But I'll, I'll go through a couple of ways that these things actually build the building blocks for the future of, of government doing stuff. So first of all, um, it, it presents some ways to improve how government does tech. If um, if government has to look at open source options, then it means you're less likely to just pre-choose a particular product and then only be limited to that product. It means you actually have to look across different products and different ways of doing things and different solutions. If open standards are actually prioritised, you've got a better chance of interoperability. If open data is prioritised, you've got a better chance of sharing knowledge and sharing information and multiple people using the same sources of truth than everyone just going and inventing their own. Um, this concept of building on the shoulders of giants, which is so in, you know, intuitive to all of us because of our background and our participation in the community, um, getting this idea of thinking globally, which is, again, natural for all of us. All of us see ourselves as part of you know, a global movement, a global community of people, which is you know, then split down into a whole bunch of individual projects. But you know, we actually see ourselves as global citizens in a lot of cases. Um, as opposed to someone who is limited by the physical confines of their desk. <laughs> so, you know, so we, we build on the shoulders of giants. And getting this mentality into government 
of building on the shoulders of giants, of thinking globally, of working globally is really important, which sort of brings us to collaboration. Um, the open source community in particular has been exceptional at showing what um, a balance between competition and collaboration can mean. In government, people tend to compete for funding and tend to then try to sort of say, well, this is why we should have all the funding. And it's often treated like a zero-sum game. If you can actually identify areas that you can collaborate on in order to be more, you know, to get better outcomes, to get better um, tools, to get better implementation, better consistency, all that kind of good stuff, and at the same time compete on what they actually need to compete on, then um, you actually get a more healthy um, approach. And then when you get that idea of collaboration across departments, then you start to also be able to get the idea of collaborating across governments, across jurisdictions, across with the private sector, um, with community organisations, and starting to get rid of those artificial barriers, and they are completely artificial, that, um, that have, um, I guess, historically stopped people from going out and, and working with other people. Because, you know, we're, we are actually all people. We are actually all one part of, you know, just one part of a huge network of nodes, each one of us a node, regardless of who we work for or where we work from. Anyway, um, fourthly, uh, modular and interoperable design. So getting away from huge behemoth systems that do one thing and moving towards, I guess, Unix design, or, you know, what all of us tend to do. What's the best tool for the job? And then you get the best tools for the job to work with each other. And that way you can switch out different tools as things improve or get um, or, or new ideas come along or new technologies emerge or whatever. So rather than spending five years creating a mobile um, policy, you know, create a way to deliver mobile services, but also create at the same, you know, that same infrastructure might be able to be used for wearable computing in the future or for whatever comes after that. So really getting into better interoperability and better modular design is, I, I think, pretty critical. Um, exposing data and APIs as a service, I've sort of covered that, but I think everyone gets that. But what that leads to is matchable government. The idea, an individual department or indeed jurisdiction may not be able to actually provide the best service for a citizen for a particular thing. Um, you know, but if a citizen can themselves actually pull together the different services, the different data, the different stuff across government, you know, they can actually solve their own itch. I think JFDI is a, is a pretty key building block for the future of government. Rather than, you know, um, creating new itches, you know, or what I have just called dancing with mosquitoes, you know, actually identifying the problem, solving the problem, not building a policy for a policy or a work group to solve a governance, whatever, actually getting out there and solving problems is, is what will um, take us towards the future. If you spend three years coming up with a plan, then your plan's probably out of date before you even have a chance to implement it. Um, meritocracy, I think, is an important one. I think to some degree that exists, um, it, it exists at least in principle in, in a lot of governments, um, but, um, but really learning from that idea that it's not just about rising through the ranks, but rather it's about, you know, who's right for that particular task and um, has the right skills at that time. Taking more project approach to solving problems rather than a hierarchical approach. So, and, and starting to let people shine for their natural skills regardless of what level they are in that hierarchy. You might have the lowest pos you know, level in public service, but they might be brilliant at something and should be able to work on it. They shouldn't be sort of forced to go through 10 years of promotions before they get to work on something they're actually good at. Um, and finally, and this is a big one for me, is actual technical excellence, not just aiming for what will get the job done, but actually valuing cleverness as a core tenant. This is what I like to call the hacker ethos, and you know, all of us get that, right? But bringing the hacker ethos in the government, looking at you know, actually valuing technical excellence, valuing cleverness, valuing cool ways of, of solving tricky, wicked problems, I think is, a, um, is something that appeals from a policy sense to people in government, but um, but it hasn't really, you know, um, got into the, the, the technical um, mentality in government. So I think that's a clear a clear building block for the future to make sure that what um, government does is is actually awesome and not you know just good enough. A um, bit of an example for you um, is DataGovAU. Obviously, I've been walking the talk. I haven't just been sort of talking about this stuff. When I came into this project, DataGovAU had been running for two years. Um, was launched with, you know, a great amount, and so now I'm sort of putting my, I guess, my work hat on a little bit, but 
No, I'm putting my one on. Okay. Um, so when I took on Dalek over you, it, it wasn't doing very much. Um, we very quickly, you know, established a very small team, um, and we we looked at what was happening around the world, what was happening in Australia, and we started from the principle that you know is open data actually good for government, for the people, for anyone? Um, not because we didn't believe, but because we wanted to you know test the hypothesis a little bit. So we started looking at, okay, where does it work, where doesn't it work, who is it good for? Um, and what we found is that by identifying ways that open data actually helps agencies themselves, it made it a lot more um, of interest to agencies to do open data. If you can show an agency, if you can show a government department, look, you know, this will help you as well as, you know, being useful to the community, as well as being useful to the private sector, this will actually help you. Um, it, it really um, changed the way they do things. So we took a fairly iterative approach. Um, we took a, you know, creating a path of least um, resistance but highest technical excellence approach that I was talking about before. And we, cr we created something which is highly functional and, um, and really useful um, for data users and data publishers and made it so that government can actually consume its own data in better ways than it ever has before. So we went from 500 data sets to 5,200 data sets. There's now five state and territory um, data portals, although there was one at the same time. Um, uh, the national and Victorian data portal started around the same time initially. Um, but now we've got you know, one federal, five states, um, and a, a couple of local government portals. And we're all in the process of trying to figure out how to share the information about those data sets to make it easy to have no wrong door in. But I guess where I'm getting at is, we, we figured out what worked, we made it easy for departments to publish, really easy to publish. We showed them the value to them in publishing, as well as understanding what the value is to the, to the public. And, um, and we turned around the entire narrative around open data from one of retrospective compliance, which is always a pain, um, to, you know, this is actually how to do future stuff better. This is how to engage. This is how to create better stuff. This is how um, you know, your department can actually um, be better. And that's been a, it's been a real shift. It's been really good. Um, I can come back to and answer any questions specifically about data over you, but just a couple of examples. So we took this model. Um, I won't go into this in great length, but the whole idea is to make all government data programmatically accessible, full, you know, f full discovery across them all, or at least all government data that's possible to be publicly accessible. Obviously, you don't want your personal Medicare records publicly available or anything crazy like that. But, um, but the more data that we can make discoverable, programmably accessible and all that kind of stuff, the easier it is for people to play with it. Lots of portals around, um, also in New Zealand. Sorry, I didn't have New Zealand on this um, particular slide because I just ran out of time, but there's some great work happening in New Zealand around this too. There's a whole bunch of links here to case studies and documentation that's in the slides that you can check out at your leisure. But, um, I mean, for me personally, to see 100 years of patent and IP data released on data.gov.au, that, I mean, I remember 10 years ago trying to do analysis on what patents existed, what patents were in um, the grace period, and being able to understand, well, you know, what if I can identify prior art on a patent, um, you know, before it becomes um, formalised so that we can actually get, you know, so we, so we can actually avoid problems into the future. There's some really, really amazing data that's available now that just wasn't available even a couple of years ago. So uh, it's worth having a look at, encouraging and getting involved. Lots of functionality. We do lots of stuff. All of our stats and everything's public. Whatever there's, there's monthly or bi-monthly progress updates, so you can check those out. And we put up case studies and such. And there's a public data request site, so people can request stuff. Um, we put up budget stuff. I won't go into that into great detail. But what was clever there is we got lots and lots and lots and lots of documents from government that were not machine readable. So we created some machine readable. We extracted and published some machine readable data from that which then got turned into cool stuff like the Open Budget or Budget Oz or a whole bunch of other budget community-driven projects. Um, sometimes we're seeing data published by an agency, which then gets picked up by someone turned into an application. So the ABC in Australia created an interactive tool to look at social security payments, which is based on a quarterly updated, um, aggregated data publishing by that agency. And again, you just wouldn't have seen this kind of stuff even a year or two ago happening as a regular thing. Um, and finally, I guess, around this stuff is we're really starting to encourage and to start seeing now the idea of building into systems open by design. So drawing that line in the sand and starting to build in proactive publishing, but also interoperability, reuse, um, you know, around different systems that are in government. It's only early days, but it's, it's really quite encouraging to start to see change in this space. 
<laughs> the final point I guess I want to make here is um, government has a lot of bits that are useful to people. Some of those bits are data, some of it's services, APIs, um, you know, uh, information about departments, about offices, you know, th there's lots and lots of stuff that is useful. If we can identify and make all of those individual bits available to people easily in a, in a way they can discover and search and then consume, then we have all the bits, right? You know, you have all the Lego bits and then you can make a spaceship today, you can make a pirate ship tomorrow, you could make a, a ninja cave the next day. Um, you can actually do stuff, but until we have and, and, you know, it, it's going to take a little bit of time, but I think we're already on the path of creating that, um, you know, pile of Lego in the lounge room that we can start building stuff with. Um, okay, so finally, I guess, because we'll, I think there's probably time for questions now. Um, so my final couple of messages. The future is here. It's already widely distributed. I tend to say that a lot. It's obviously riffing off Gibson, so thank you, Gibson. Um, but, you know, it is already widely distributed. Government moves slower than other um, institutions than other parts of society. And so government's learning to be part of our world, and this is our world, um, and, um, and government's having su some success with that, and it's coming along the path. It won't move as fast as we want it to, but it's going to move, and it is moving faster than it expects itself to. And that's been really funny. I have people say, oh, I can't believe how much you've achieved in 18 months. And I'm like, really? I was hoping to do at least three times this amount. Um, but... We're, so governments are, are coming on the journey, and that's really exciting. But so some of the challenges, I guess, for Audi are you know looking at how to collaborate, looking at how to design and lead, um, and 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 this is the last one really here is something I try to tell my um, <laughs> tell other public servants: make sure you actually have fun with this stuff, because uh, you know if it's not fun, then we won't do it really. So, um, but um, yeah, uh, you know, looking at stuff, leading, designing, working collaboratively, and making sure we continue to have fun, and then we'll be able to do some um, some really good stuff. So, um, what I might do is open up some questions. I've got a whole bunch of blog posts I've put up recently around um, collaboration, around policy, around a whole bunch of stuff that will only be of interest to you if you're the sort of person that's probably come to this talk. <laughs> um, but um, it might be of interest to a bunch of you anyway. So, can I recommend checking that out? And I should probably jump to some questions. So hold on. Let me turn off your mutey bits. I think you're still muted. Hold on. Uh, Ryan, can you unmute yourself? How's that? Hey! Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, I'll give it a go. Oh. Um, I was thinking, I, if I, this doesn't work, well, people can probably tweet questions at you as well, but we'll give this a go. Yeah, cool. Well, I figured allowing for about 10 minutes of just sort of discussion, because I'm sure, uh, yeah, I'm sure it, uh, there'll be a lot of uh, questions around this kind of stuff. So um, over to you guys. Thank you very much. I can still see you. <laughs> um, cool. So now that we've got data.gov.au and uh, like gov.cms is coming online, where to next? Sorry, so you're asking what's the relationship between data.gov.au and gov.cms? No, it's just uh, uh, that's the government is now. Sorry, uh, so now the uh, government is uh, opening up data and is actually migrating the federal sites to uh, Drupal. Um, where can we really go, go to next? Where's going to be the next sort of big thing that we can sort of push government into open or using open technologies and such? Yeah, cool. It's a really good. Question. I think, look, I think some of that comes to, um, so first of all, there's some stuff I just can't talk about right now that, um, that I want to, but I can't. So um, some of that, you know, might come up soon. Um, I, think, I actually think that even though we've started on the path of data and we've started on the path of, uh, you know, web has certainly been a massive game changer for open source in government. Because simply a lot of the web tools, sorry, a lot of the open source web tools are, you know, just, just outshined a lot of their competitors very, very quickly um, over the last sort of five or ten years. So, um, so that's been um, a real game changer for us. But there's still a big challenge in a lot of the traditional IT departments because um, in, in a lot of cases the web um, teams are completely separate from the IT departments. Um, and I actually feel for IT departments because IT departments have had too little money to do core services for a long time and are really struggling and um, it's hard for them to change and it's hard for them to get new money or new people or new skills and all that kind of stuff. So I actually think that um, we need to spend a little bit of time trying to engage with and trying to support and trying to change the culture of and 
practices of IT departments, and there's a whole bunch of ways we could do that. I mean, we have some of the best DevOps people in the world in our community, um, arguably the best, I would suggest, and, um, and so trying to bring some of those DevOps ideas into government, I think, would be really cool. Um, but there's also that mashable government thing. So getting government websites onto GovCMS is still a whole bunch of websites, right? Getting government data onto, gov onto data.gov.au, it makes both of those things a bit more programmatically accessible, but it doesn't still solve problems. So what are actual problems we need to solve and how do we solve it across jurisdictions? You know, if you, if you want to pay um, you know, your rates or you want to find out your health, if you want to uh, understanding problems that we can solve across governments and coming up with cool ways to solve them I think is important. Um, and I think the other thing that open source is, is really helpful for government is looking at all of those translation things. So looking at how to um, how to do the plumbing uh, between systems, between sources, between APIs uh, to actually make stuff usable and, re and mashable and that kind of stuff I think is really handy. So mashable, I think there's a lot of opportunities. Um, and um, yeah, the, the, there's a bunch more work to do, but um, but sysadmin and BAU sort of stuff in governments is definitely also a, a big challenge still. Does that give you a bit of a bit of an idea? Thank you. Yeah, I might have yeah, to ask you that. Your, all your BSC is called Plan of Sync, so. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> okay, okay, bye. Can you hear us, Pia? No, no, no. Hello. It's worse now. It's good. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So I'm just gonna. Sorry, there was one other question from the room, and then I should probably do some questions from Twitter. Hello. Um, Dale has kind of responded to something I tweeted about you said, that she's keen to know the answers to open data inquiry. Does it forward societies and the evidence for and against? So I know you've got some stories of where you have put the data out and it has led to good things. Perhaps you could tell us about, you know, give us a concrete example. Sure. Okay, cool. Um, so for starters, I think that there are specific and broad benefits of open data specifically. Specific benefits um, for society and specific benefits for departments and then where those where they cross. So I'll start I'll actually start with government because I think that that gives some of the benefits for society as well. Um, the, I guess the, the core reasons why open data is helping departments and government well the public service specifically is um, first of all um, it's it is actually cheaper than publishing on their own websites in some cases and developing their own APIs on their own systems where they need API access to their data. Um, so rather than you know taking your internal database, trying to build an API in order to feed your own application or website that you have to publish anyway because it's part of your normal work, if you throw the data on data.gov.au and set up a way to automatically update that, and we've got a number of departments doing that now, and then you know they can just leverage it as free infrastructure. Um, so saving money. Some of it's around saving time. A lot of departments have to publish data anyway for, um, for parliamentary reasons, for public reasons, for freedom of information reasons, for media reasons. And so by putting it on data.gov.au or putting it up publicly anywhere, they can say to people, rather than having to go and extract it and make it available every time they get the request, they can just say, here's the URL, go check it out. So it actually makes people a bit more efficient and, um, and that's quite useful. Um, there's some other benefits around sharing data, so rather than every department having to collect, you know, the amount of effort it takes to sh sh share data between departments is, is not small. Doing anything between departments can be quite complex, you know, sometimes people want to put in place an MOU or an NDA or another TLA um, and a whole bunch of bureaucracy just to talk to each other. 
Um, so in some cases, actually sharing the data publicly is less effort than, um, and you get the benefit of everyone getting access to it, rather than just sharing it between two departments and with all the traditional models of sharing. Um, so there's just a couple. Um, personally, I think that there's also then the accountability benefit. Um, if the data about your contracts, which is publicly available in Australia, is publicly available, at least everything over 10K is publicly available in Australia, then it, it, it makes people think just that little bit extra about what they're spending money on um, because it is going to be publicly accountable, it is going to be publicly available. I think that that small level of accountability, or well, quite large for some people, um, is good because it drives um, better discipline, better behaviours, better practices, and I think that has a benefit to both the public service and to the public. Um, benefits to society, I think some. Of, I think a lot of these are actually quite obvious in some ways, but we have a lot of case studies that we're starting. Well, I mean, in the early days we just got things done. We didn't actually have time to do a lot of documentation, but we've tried to do more case studies recently and we're starting to collect more now, a lot more now. But um, things like the budget was quite interesting. So we um, published data from the Australian federal budget last year for the first time ever, right? They've published, you know, they publish the papers every year. I think they published the papers as well. Maybe, yeah. But it actually wasn't driven from us, strangely enough. Um, I mean, obviously we push for that kind of stuff, but it, it is actually a, a symptom of a changing perspective, which is quite good. But here's what we did. We specifically went and spoke to journalists, and we specifically went and spoke to budget data users from the community um, that we knew of and um, prior to publishing anything and said, look, not promising anything because we can't, but if we could publish budget data, what would you prioritise? And then they gave us like their top list, and then we got most of that stuff um, published, right? All the portfolio budget statement documents and, um, and a whole bunch of tables from um, that the people wanted to see. And by prioritising that, we were then able to ask them afterwards, okay, how much time did that save you? Because you didn't have to go and screen scrape the PDFs of all those documents individually. How much, you know, and then we were able to say, this is how much time it saved journalists and the public, and we're able to, you know, with some confidence extrapolate that out to, you know, here's how much actual time it saved and here's how much time we think it might have saved across the economy. Um, but then we were also able to say, this is the first time ever <laughs> the government itself has had access to that data. So then we can actually compare what agencies say or departments say they spend against what they actually spend in the central budget system. So um, it created a, an internal benefit there as well. And so we try to find case studies and then document them, and we put those case, that case study up on the blog, and there's a bunch of others up on the blog as well, that show actual benefits. And we're about to put in place over the next, I guess, six months or so, um, just there's a bunch of projects going on right now, but one project we want to do is add a metadata field, the data sets, that says how much time or effort has, this, has publishing this data set saved you to departments. And in some cases it will be zero. But in some cases it'll be, you know, thirty thousand dollars, or three days a month, or one day a year, or in some cases we've got like two weeks of effort to save by just pushing data and data together. You um, uh, every quarter for some of the data sets that we're playing with, and by by collecting that, even though it'll probably only be a minority of data sets that that affects, it'll start to get a a, a um, growing over time picture of how much time and money. Open data is actually saving. Um, now, in terms of gen um, benefits to the society, I mean, there's heaps of benefits around people being able to build businesses around, about accountability, about um, uh, holding the government to account and holding public service to account, and I'm running out of time. End of the question. Next question. Okay. We've got time for one more question. <laughs> oh, hi, Pierre. Um, I'll try and do it quick. Okay, I, I have had interactions with government, and I'm hoping ours is similar that you, enough that you could answer this question. My interactions have, for example, been in the wake of the Christchurch earthquake, open source community formed to do things, um, and more recently, some of us trying to get metadata attached to Hansard. And in both times, we've struggled. We only get one real meeting with government. We don't get to follow up and, and do this and then do this. Like you, you mentioned, you asked in this question and this question. I don't get that as a citizen. I most get one meeting, and I'm really struggling. To um, to get them to oh, maybe respect is maybe the wrong word. They they definitely view me as that person climbing up that tower to come get them. Um, and I'm wondering if you had advice on how to do that initial and eventually only communication that I have with the person who can give me the the data that I'm seeking. Yeah, of um, and there's a couple of answers to that. And it is it is challenging a lot of times from the outside because particularly from the outside. Um, the machine of formal media communications and public relations gets in the way of geeks talking to geeks, right? 
um, if you can actually go and talk to the people that actually do the thing, it, it becomes a lot easier. But um, but often oftentimes it gets, uh, I guess, seen through the 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 lens of public relations, which makes it very very tricky. Because then there becomes, you know, why, why are they asking? How are they going to use this for a right? Um, I think in some cases going in and helping solve the problem is a good start and saying, look, this is how you currently do things, um, here's how you could do it which would make this better for you and better for us and more consumable and stuff. So going in with a solution, not just a problem, I think is key. Um, it's one of the pieces of advice my, my boss actually gave me when I first came in, you know, always come with a solution, not just a problem. Because there's lots of problems and you can rattle problems off the top of your head, but if you come forward with a solution, often enough the people you're talking to are, are going to be more receptive. Um, a multi-pronged attack, I think, is important in building your allies, um, talking to multiple people in multiple ways, and always, and this is actually really important, annoying as it can be, and, I, and believe me, it's, it's more annoying for me than it will be for most of you, even though you're coming from the outside, um, always being positive, always being polite, always being respectful, always saying, um, oh, yeah, that's really great, but here's how we can do it better, and here's why we should do it this way, because it, it, it's very easy to get angry and say, Oh, why? Why? But understanding why they're coming from the perspective they're coming from is important to help them do it better. So, um, and for me, the way I've started doing that is I've actually gone and started doing study. You know, what is the what is the approach to policy making that traditional public servants take? And by learning that, even though it's completely wrong <laughs> in my view, um, I now know how they think. So it means I can talk to them with their language in a better way. So it, does, it takes more effort on our part. The people who want to make change, it's always going to be almost um, on our heads to actually make that difference. But yeah, we, we, if you want to make change, then you've got to take on that responsibility, unfortunately, but fortunately. And keep in mind that if you don't take on that effort, then other people with pretty stupid ideas will take on that effort. Um, and so you know, we need to be in there and, um, and, and, and get your allies and use your allies and even do what I did, go and work with government and try and change it from the inside. Completely out of time now. Completely out of time now. So, so thank you very much. And I've got a little present for you, and we'll figure out uh, some way of getting it to you. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Bye.